Hello everyone, I am super excited. We have another really fun interview. I talked to my friend, Rob Nelson. I met him a couple of years ago at the museum through Roland Kays, who is the head of the biodiversity lab that I used to work in. And Rob is a scientist turned science filmmaker. And he's also on the show, What on Earth with me on the Science Channel, although we never filmed together, but a lot of times we have the same uh, uh, storylines that we talk about. But Rob is um, making his dream as a science filmmaker come true. He has a YouTube channel, Stone Age Man, and some of his videos have millions of views. So if you are interested in this field as a career, he definitely has a lot of tips for you. Or if you're just a scientist like me who's interested in science communication, he also has some really valuable tips for you. So I just love their conversation. It's so much fun and I hope you enjoy. Hi, Rob. Welcome to the Fancy Scientist podcast. I am so excited to have you on today. Yes, thank you. I put on my fancy sweater for you. <laughs> I like it. It's very, it's very winter chic. <laughs> so you are a, a science or a wildlife videographer. Is that how you would call yourself? Is that how you would describe yourself? Well, it always depends who I'm talking to because people have different levels of understanding. I would never call myself a biologist to a biologist because <laughs> I don't do research necessarily. Um, but I, I also hate the word videographer because it makes me feel like I just do weddings or something. So I, I always yeah. say at least science filmmaker. <laughs> but I, I most of the time I actually call myself a biologist because I started out with a master's degree in biology. And the whole reason I picked up the skill of doing science filmmaking was that so I could communicate better. So I hate dropping the idea of being a biologist because that's really where my heart is on things. So yeah, combination science filmmaker probably would suit this podcast. It is interesting. Somebody asked me, like, what is a scientist recently? And I know that's like a whole different discussion, but it's interesting. Like, so someone like myself too, I've been doing research for like, I guess like 17 years now and I have all these publications and I'm still going to be doing research, but probably not as much and not leading it. And it's like, do I call myself a scientist still, even though I'm, I'm taking a, a little bit of a break, but, um, but yeah, that's, you're definitely a scientist. Well, you know, I th I was thinking more about it. Um, I so I, I've been doing a bunch of TV shows in, in the last five years, and the part of the reason I got a bunch of the shows was because they wanted a real biologist, like a real scientist, is what they said. And at that time, I was much closer to being a scientist because I had you know gotten out of it fairly recently. And then, um, like last year, they're like, "Oh, you don't really fit the bill anymore because you're just a TV host." It's like, well, that's because I've been spending all of my time with you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> how am I supposed to do both? So it, it's hard to kind of do two things, but. Yeah, definitely. I don't know. <laughs> so tell us how you made that transition. So you're doing master's research. And then how did you make the transition to telling science stories through film? Um, so when I was an undergraduate in. Um, actually doing an exchange program in Australia, doing marine science, I had seen, I saw a documentary on the coral reefs and I always wanted to study coral reefs. I knew I was going to get a master's degree and I you thought I would just become a scientist, but I watched a presentation and got really excited about the idea of actually telling those stories. So I asked the people how they got started into doing this and they, and, and what advice they would have. And they told me just grab a video camera, maybe a, 800 to a thousand dollar camera and just tell as many stories as I could. So for my undergraduate um, kind of present to myself, because my, my parents apparently told all their friends to give me money for graduation. That's what you do. So I used all that money to get a, about a thousand dollar camera. And then I took that with me to grad school and started, I probably told a story every month, like a short story, um, just in the process of being in grad school, I, I showed them to my undergraduate lab classes because I taught for five years doing undergraduate labs and they loved it. So we, we did we did intro to biology. So I had like echinoderms and you know, mollusks and every single one I'd go out and maybe go scuba diving and show them echinoderms. You know, and, and they loved that part of it. And in fact, what happened is the biology department decided to pay me to make it so that all of the the intro biology teachers could use my videos instead of the ones they bought 
because they were just a little oh, wow. more fun and engaging and local, you know, they were in Hawaii. And then I started going around and making some for the biology department. And at some point I actually applied for a grant through the University of Hawaii arts, science, arts and sciences program to make a, a doc, an hour long documentary. At that point I called it the biodiversity of Mexico and I got it. It was only like $6,000 grant, but I also got another few thousand dollars from Patty and we were going to tell from the, the scuba diving, right? Mexico. Yeah. The Patty scuba diving, not just your friend, Patty, <laughs> <laughs> not my friend, Patty, right. Patty professional divers, something. Uh, and, uh, that, that first documentary I made in grad school, it took me a year to edit it up and it wow. was really well received. I, I took six grad students with me and we drove through Mexico in a little van. And then after that, I realized that there was a grad school that you could get a master's degree in science filmmaking at, and it was in Montana state. So I used that documentary to apply to the, to the grad school, got in, and then it kind of just snowballed from there. Cause once I get into grad school, it, it leapfrogs you ahead a few years. Cause you're told all of the things to do. You weren't just blind going and doing it. Um, and that's, that's the basics of how I made the transition anyway, was just, mm -hmm. I, I enjoyed the process, I think. And I was doing the process while doing biology and it was just a natural fit, I think for me to, to make the transition to only communication versus research and a little communication, you know? Yeah. yeah. When you were making the films in the beginning, did you know what you were doing? Like, did you follow other documentarians or did you just like completely play around and make these films and had fun with it? You know, well, there was no YouTube at the beginning. So there yeah. were tutorials I could find. I read the owner's manual to, <laughs> to the camera <laughs> and to the editing program I was using. There were books though. There were some books. I did have... <laughs> I'm trying to see if I have the book handy. Yeah, the, my very first book was this one, which was which I still actually find is really useful. It's called Making Documentary Films and Reality Videos. And this one was, I think, was is the closest to the YouTube stuff that I do. Um, and so I, I read one book and it kind of t t talked about pre-production and production and post-production and how you might fit it all together. But it was, it was, it was really stressful at the beginning because I didn't know if I was going to be able to fulfill my commitments that I had sold on, you know, like the grants that people gave me or, mm -hmm. or, you know, the biology department hiring me to do something. It was real stressful shooting because, you know, yeah, I, I didn't know what the end product was actually going to look like. And I think that's true for almost everybody that starts out. You just, it's, it's hard at the beginning to, to know what the end product is going to be. So, yeah, that was about all I was going off of for about five years <laughs> until grad school. <laughs> 2000 to 2005, I was on my own. And then I got a and then you, <laughs> And then you started your company, um, Untamed Science. It was called First, and then it transitioned into Stone Age Man. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, so... Actually, in 2003, I started a company called Explore Biodiversity because the whole point was to just explore different animals and plants. And then it turned into the wild classroom because we, we wanted to make videos that were for classrooms, but kind of a little more untamed, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But the problem was um, Pearson Publishing saw what we were doing uh, in 2007 and said, we really like your style we want you to replace the Discovery Channel who's now making our textbook videos. And, and if you can kind of imagine if you have a certain budget as a textbook company, but you give all the money to Discovery to use their stock footage basically, then the, the, it's gonna end up being a little bit boring to be honest because the level of corporate uh, money pull, so to, you know, there's a lot of money that just goes to bureaucracy at a certain mm -hmm. point and then and the video the money wasn't going to the fun filmmakers and the editors so they they saw what we were doing and, and basically gave us the same contract so we had the first year was a half million dollar contract to create what was it 30 35 videos for their high school biology book and that allowed us to cr start the company uh, we turned it into untamed science because there we own full ownership of the trademark of that name it was mm -hmm. some, somehow people didn't own that yet and that allowed us to hire we had 12 employees that first year creating videos 
And that oh, really wow. kind of got us off the ground. Yeah, it was it was really exciting. Uh, from about 2008 to 2011, we were full time just busting at making science videos. We got a lot of experience, um, learned a lot of the things not to do, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and then but then at the same time, all of our videos were behind a payroll paywall. So mm -hmm. that was right around the beginning of YouTube 2006 2007. But we had all of our videos on another channel we had on blip TV. And so I was watching all these other science filmmakers really take off with very similar or even not as good of videos, but we weren't in the space yet. So I'm a little bit playing catch up right now. I feel <laughs> we'll see. I don't know. You never know how the algorithms work. And, but, and yeah. then you started putting your videos on YouTube. Uh, yeah. Or making so, new ones for YouTube. So YouTube is funny because very few people will let you make a video for them and then put it on YouTube, on your own YouTube channel. Yeah, right. right? So a lot of the stuff that I made on YouTube was either a re-edit of videos I had already done or just in my free time during the shoot, I would shoot other stuff. Mm -hmm. and then be able to put it out. And uh, I always saw the potential of YouTube and I still see the potential of YouTube. And we can get into more of that later. Um, and right now I'm calling everything on YouTube Stone Age Man just as a way to rebrand because for 10 years I had things as Untamed Science and they, the numbers just really weren't um, moving up for us. But as soon as we changed it to Stone Age Man, it, it actually helped. And I don't know if it was just the algorithm found a video or two or the name really mattered, it's hard to today. Because <laughs> you know? yeah, now you have what hundreds of thousands of subscribers. Mm -hmm. and... Yeah, we have about 150,000 on Stone Age. And don't some of your videos have like millions of views? Yeah, we have a few videos. Well, we probably, yeah, like three, three or four videos over a million. Uh, one has 10 million. So that's most of our view. About wow. half of the views come from one video, which has 10 million. So why Stone Age Man? And why do you think that, like, that sounds to me kind of different from Untamed Science and concept and maybe like what you're filming about. So what, what, how'd you decide on that versus something maybe more wildlifey or marine biology with mm -hmm. your roots? Mm -hmm. Well, I, let's see how I can put this. Um, for 10 years, the goal was to make science fun with Untamed Science. And that was the whole point of the name. Um, it's science, but it's untamed. <laughs> and I thought that we were maybe trying to reach the person at the back of the class that found science boring. But what I found is that the market changed a little bit in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And I don't think there's this need to make science so fun anymore. It just, it felt like there was enough people making science fun. Everybody was making science fun. And so I started to think, what is the most important thing that I see around me? And really what was happening is that I was seeing, I was seeing my wife, Haley, deal with uh, depression. I was going through depression and, and it wasn't because science wasn't fun. <laughs> you know, it was, I think, because... There was, a, there was a disconnect between the way we were living our lives and the, and the way we had evolved as humans to live our lives. And so when I started thinking about it, as a biologist, I study all these animals and you try to understand what behaviors they have that allow them to adapt to their surroundings. We are animals just like all those other things I studied, except mm -hmm. we, st we evolved in the Stone Age. And so if you can kind of tap into a basic understanding of nature, but related to our stone age self, I think we would be healthier and probably happier. And so it was just a change in how I wanted to teach about things. I just didn't, I didn't want to find like an interesting science fact and make it jazzy and fun and be on skateboards mm -hmm. and skydiving. <laughs> I wanted to just tap into like a little bit of primitive knowledge, but like an application of the wildlife around us. And um, part of it was that I went on a, um, a hike in the woods and took some mushrooms and uh, had this realization. So that's the best way <laughs> to explain it, really. That's but, great. <laughs> but, but a lot of it just relates to mental health, to be honest. You know, and part of, part of me is a little bit worried that the, the Stone Age man thing in today's current culture is going to uh, turn some people off. But 
I'm also just okay with people if they get upset by that. Just oh, because it's not woman or people, Stone Age people. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the word is. But you are a man. That's true. So I and I and I wanted there. The channel had always been confusing because it was like multiple hosts, and I wanted just one thing that was mine. Yeah. Okay. I'll just I'll. I'll lean into the Stone Age man thing a little bit. <laughs> that makes sense. My only thought was that because I've tried all these different diets, is it reminded me kind of like of the paleo diet. Like, hey. like, right. But well, I yeah, wanted it. So I think, you know, I talked to a couple of friends who do marketing and that's obviously as a biologist. Originally, that's not my expertise. Yeah. But I said, you know what? It doesn't matter what your name is. You just need people to remember it. And then, you know. So, so, so far, Stone Age Man is more memorable than Untamed Science because for some reason, nobody could remember Untamed Science. It, that was better, of course, than some names, but like everybody always mm -hmm. got it wrong. They're like, what is, what is your name? Unsomething Science? <laughs> Untamed. Untamed Science. It's not hard. <laughs> oh, so you're, know. you're trying so hard to, um, make science fun that it didn't become fun anymore is that what you're trying to say well i've i've felt that way because or, or not that it i was trying to make it fun but like once you're in it so much it like can not become fun and what really what really yeah. helped me was when i um worked with kids in there's this, this nsf program called gk12 and we worked with teachers in classrooms and i remember just being like so depressed, like about my research, not working, like my, my dung samples, not amplifying their DNA yeah. correctly. And I would talk to kids and they were just like, so excited that I was like picking up elephant poop to begin with. <laughs> like they were so fascinated by that. And I was like, wow. Yeah. Like what I do is cool. So I think you just get like lost in the, the weeds and the details of everything that, that you lose sight of it sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, having talked to you over the years, I think the thing that it's really hard not to do is get burnt out doing yeah. jobs like this because one, you're spinning your wheels a lot for what feels like little payout when you look at numbers at times. Mm -hmm. And um, and two, you're in this weird situation, which is the disconnect from how Stone Age Man evolved. <laughs> you're sitting alone in your house, staring mm -hmm. at a virtual screen and you're not really interacting with people. And so that I think bother me sometimes i i don't know you know it's i if untamed science just was killing it i would have kept it the name it yeah it's just i i needed a change um yeah and i think this was a nice chance to to have a change the mushrooms helped <laughs> <That's> <laughs> i have a great. feeling my parents won't listen to this so i can say that and have has the the concept of the videos changed at all like you, i guess you're doing more more connections with nature as opposed to just like science facts. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Um, I think my litmus test now, it, it's very similar to what I used to do. I still want to make the videos fun and engaging and I want to add science into them. But my litmus test is, um, is there is there a practical way people can utilize what you're looking at somehow, right? Mm -hmm. So I might not do an oddball video about shrimp gobies, which is what I studied unless I somehow tied it to the hammerhead sharks that eat them somehow, mm -hmm. or how can you do something useful? Like how can you fish in the salt flats? Yeah. <laughs> and can you use this animal, or is it deadly poisonous or is it, I don't know, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so the only reason for doing that is I have to make a living on YouTube and I found mm -hmm. that people find it a lot more interesting learning about things that they can either eat or kill you <laughs> or, you know, it's, and it's, it's not the, that th those fields are super saturated. I mean, maybe if you just talk about the big dangerous ones like tigers and polar bears and things, those are super saturated. But there's plenty of things to pick in those things without getting deep, deep into the weeds of some random animal <laughs> or bug or something. <laughs> so you, you mentioned numbers. Can you expand on that? Like what, what did you mean by like, like kind of getting down on numbers? Um, okay. Well, here's a good example to, if you're trying to make money on YouTube, you roughly can use 
uh, $2,000 per million views as an estimate of how much money somebody's making. So on average with Untamed Science on YouTube, I was making about $60 a month. Before, wow. Yeah, before I changed the name. Um, a couple of the videos went viral. So I had one month now where I've made almost $5,000. But most months I'm making between 600 and 900 on Untamed Science, which is not a lot. You mean Stone Age Man or un Untamed uh, Science? Sorry. Yeah, it's right. Stone Age Man. Okay. Right now when I switched it over. Yeah. But I have five YouTube channels. So all of those combined, it's closer to 2000 on average dollars a month, which is not enough to live on. Right. But it's getting closer. And, and the nice thing about YouTube is that Unlike, unlike the other work that I do, where I go job to job and scientist to scientist from grant to grant, at least if I can form a base number of followers who enjoy the mm -hmm. content, then I have some sustainability. You know, I don't know if you've ever, I don't know if your parents ever ask, so how much do you make a month? <laughs> what? And you're like, um, for me, I always, I always, always tell my dad, I don't know, dad, either zero or $10,000 roughly a month. It's anywhere in the between. I have no idea how to predict because it's job to job. So yeah. I, I like the idea of trying to find a platform that's sustainable and reliable. So you so YouTube is your main income stream then and you you do other jobs then when they're offered to you or you seek them out? Um I think just a lot of people are interested, like how you actually yes. make this happen. So I would say up until this year, YouTube has been only about five percent of my income. Mm -hmm. um, this year, I'm trying to make it close to half of my income. Um, so I can I can go through some of the numbers if you're curious. I don't know uh, kind of how you want to to frame that, but th it is a very alternative career in science outreach. What I'm doing, and mm -hmm. I'm I'm happy to give numbers for people uh, because I think it's useful to uh, set your expectations realistically. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. If you want to give a couple of examples, that'd be great. Well, okay. So any, so why don't I just start with kind of a comparison between a normal production job and YouTube. Mm -hmm. So on average, and, and this goes back almost 10 years, I would quote clients for the level of work that we're doing a video at um, anywhere between 2000 and $2,500 a minute to make that happen. Right. Mm -hmm. So that that's re all of the work that's required to make it happen. And oftentimes, if I have to hire people, my my calculator is I need to pay each person on the crew roughly five hundred dollars a day to make it happen. Yeah. So a let's just say a standard three minute YouTube gen, uh, video is going to cost me six thousand dollars because it might take us two weeks, two to three people working on it to make it happen. So a, a decent two three three minute video. Um, of course, that's not how YouTube works because if I was to get $6,000 for the video that I just did, um, for a three minute video, I would have to bring in, what, what are we looking at? Um, uh, 12, no, 3 million views, mm -hmm. right. To make it work that 3 million views on a video is a lot of views. Yeah. So, to actually make it pay for itself is really difficult. So I would be much better off not going on YouTube and only going through clients. But then you run into the problem, who, how, how are clients going to find you? If someone wants yeah. to make a science film, how are they going to find you? Most of the time people find me on YouTube. <laughs> so I have to treat YouTube in some ways like my marketing. Mm -hmm. So... You know, that's kind of the, the difference between the two. So uh, on a standard year, if it's just Haley and I um, and things are going well, there's no COVID around, <laughs> we may need about one hundred and twenty dollars to $150,000 working budget so that I can pay Jonas uh, and Haley and all of our travel expenses. And that allows us to, on average, get between forty dollars and $50,000 a year. Wow. Yeah, I think. You know what I mean? I yeah. When people like when you quote like, you know, two thousand dollars a minute or something, people are probably like, whoa, that's expensive. But they don't think about all of the stuff that goes into it, especially hiring people. That's that's huge. Well, I mean, even just this year alone in gear, 
I yeah. bought a new computer, which was $9,000 because of the editing I do. It's, it was a high-end one. I bought a new camera and new lenses, which were another $9,000. <laughs> you know, I think total, I probably spend 25000 a year on gear. Yeah. I don't know where the money goes because that sounds like a ton of money on gear, but you cycle through those every four, three, four years. So. Have you ever thought about like working for a company or have you ever tried to, or is that have like, like for discovery or is it that they are just mostly freelancers? Cause that's, we had a, someone talk to us um, or a bunch of speakers talk to us about science writing. And mm. most of them said that like, you know, like almost all the science writers are just freelancers and they're pitching program or pit, pitching um, stories to different uh, magazines and newspapers and stuff. Yeah, so I, I would say half of my friends work for Discovery, Science Channel, Nat Geo, or the BBC. Um, but they work in if you if you work in the U.S. for those companies, you're working in Washington D.C. or mm-hmm. Bristol in the U.K. And most of the time, that it that's like legit a job job for them. Yeah, um, which is different than the storytelling that I want to do. And if you most of the people that are like you imagine from your in your head of a Nat Geo photographer, they're freelance. It's same with the camera people, same with myself who who does hosting of shows. I've done 25 shows that I've hosted in the last four years, five wow. years. Um, that, that was mostly because I had two or I, I had that one show that went two seasons, which was nice. But um, you're freelance and you work with production companies that pitch your show. So the production mm-hmm. companies aren't Nat Geo or Discovery. They're random all over the country. Right. Yeah. So it's a weird industry in that even the production companies are freelance. <laughs> and and to be honest, I I have decided, having done it now, that I don't really like that world. And that sounds really weird and maybe even ungrateful because I told that to my wife. She's like, don't tell anybody that you're you don't <laughs> like doing that because it's I don't like hosting my own TV shows. <laughs> no, but but I, I tell you the reason for it is in 2017, I was doing pretty good with Untamed Science, finding clients and whatnot. And then I got, or no, it was 2016. And then I got offered to host a TV show. TV show really didn't pay that well. It was, it was most of the work of a year, but it was $30,000 was, was how much I was going to get paid to host it. And I was going to be gone from my family a long time, but I was like, you know what? This is going to lead to new things and it's going to really help me out. So I was like, I will do it. But then luckily that one went to season two, but I had to drop all of my, my work, my clients, everybody who I had worked for five, six years to say, let's make a film together. They finally got money in a grant or something and we're making a film. And then I have to cut it out you know, cut that contact and they go mm-hmm. to someone else and I'm, I'm done with that person and everybody moved on. So financially it was, it was a little bit of a strain. There wasn't, you know, it, it's a little bit of a gamble always. Some people get ultra famous from being on TV, but most people don't. And so there wasn't mm-hmm. like a huge payback from, from the cred necessarily that I got other than now I can tell people I don't like doing it. But uh, the reason for it is, you know, you finish your show and then you're waiting. Is it going to get its rating? You're crossing your fingers. You're like, hopefully it goes to season two so I can continue on this not huge budget. And you're at the whim of an executive in New York or in wherever they are. And it um, turns out we did, we were the fifth top rated show on Science Channel and we still didn't make it to the next season, which was frustrating. Wow. They, everybody wants the next Mythbusters you know, or yeah. the next big river monsters or something. So they put money into a lot of little shows. And if they don't get the ratings like out the roof, then they just cut it and go on to the next one, um, which is, which is okay. But then it makes you doubt yourself so much. And it's, I don't think it's super healthy because you know, like, I still don't know, was it me or was it the format of the show? You know, there's a ton of variables. I watch some of those shows and I'm like, how is this a show? <laughs> like, I actually, I'm really bad at watching the science channel and discovery. I, I never, even, I never watch any of those maybe yeah. cause it's like my career and I don't want to watch it in my off time, true, but right? 
you know, like the whole Bigfoot thing, like they have a whole show around Bigfoot mm-hmm. and they obviously never find Bigfoot. And it's like, how do you, and then like, here I have these ideas about real things. And I'm like, oh, well maybe that is not no. good enough to be like a show, <laughs> but they have like nothing. They're working with nothing I know. and they're still I able to make it a show. Up, are you talking about the one that, is it Miranda Mayer? Is that Mar- Miranda? Is that right? I don't the, know. The primatologist who is the female and then it's just a bunch of dudes. I don't watch that show. I've just seen the commercials for it. No. Oh, okay. I actually called her up because she got a ton. So she's a a professor at, I want to say University of Central Florida or University of, it's just South of Miami. So it's not Central Florida. It's um, anyway, she got a ton of heat on Twitter for doing the show and having done hosting, I called her up and was like, we should chat. And we (laughs) chatted a little bit. No, it's funny though, because the other because thing she, about TV is you can't make the call how they want to portray you. Right. So did and they portray pushing, her as like believing in Bigfoot? Is it was that why people were upset on Twitter? She was supposed to be the skept the skept the skeptical scientist. Yeah. But the the sound bites that kept making the trailer were things like, Wow, I didn't think we were gonna see anything, but now <laughs> I might be convinced there's something here or um, did you hear that? I think we, if we're going to find Bigfoot, it's here, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah. Cause, Cause they, they push you to get more and more like excited about stuff and like, just go and like run with things. But then of course they're going to use those bits. <laughs> right. And then, so then you're trying, like, you're actually getting pulled from your, your, your moral stance on things is getting like really noticeably pulled in the way that's not healthy <laughs> for the world, I think. And you can't help but not get pulled that way. Like the more and more you're in it, it's just like you've done what on earth. Yeah, it's the first one was like, okay, but now you're like getting more and more sucked into saying the sensational (laughs) things. And you're like, it's okay. And you're You're like, whatever. (laughs) Um, Yeah, sure. I'll say that. (laughs) Sure. Yeah, for for those of you who don't know, as a Rob and I do this show, What on Earth, and um, and yeah, they they do like they ask your expert opinion. There's a lot of times they're like, you know, like what would you say about this? And there's no prompts or anything. But then sometimes you'll say something, and they'll be like, well, would you say it's like this? And then you know they want you to say it in that like phrase. And it's not something that I would come up with, but usually it's not something I'm opposed. There's been a couple of 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 areas where I was opposed to like. There was one, actually, there was one with sharks that I was kind of annoyed by because I really wanted to make it like that. There were shark attacks in this area, but I really wanted to like, you know, clarify this is super rare. You know, this is a high incidence, but your chances of getting bit by a shark are like nothing. Mm. And they still made it like, you know, scary sharks in the water. And yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know anybody who's successful that hasn't gotten sucked in that direction. (laughs) But it is, I think they do a pretty good job though of keeping things really accurate. Yeah. I mean, it's just, um, I just am always like, I I think it's just a bummer that I don't have more editorial control. This is from my perspective. I wish I kind of could like shape the stories and that's okay. I mean, you're constant, like, look, I wrote a book called, with 30 species that can kill you (laughs) (laughs) yeah because i've lived in this world i know that people want to read about things that can kill you so um but the title of your book is mother nature is not trying to kill you true but you know what i had to push back on that title because they the publishers were like we want to change we want to call it mother nature is trying to kill you they said target wants to pick it up and they want it really really catchy and so target wanted it mother nature is trying to kill you and i was like oh i can't do that yeah (laughs) wrong so how did this book came come about because you noticed on on youtube that people were searching for animals that would kill them um so august of uh 2019 this this publisher mango publishing came to me and i don't know how they found me they they said they have some sort of algorithm that shows who might be good at writing a book. I had already written one and then I had a YouTube channel and some social following. So I have a feeling it was probably like that, but um, mm-hmm. they're the same publishers of Coyote Peterson. And so there was some tie to that world. 
And so they asked me what I wanted to write on. And, and so what they do often with a book, especially the way I did it, I guess, is they pitch the book title. And once the title gets pitched, then you write the book. So we, we, we actually were originally going to call it Surviving Random Acts of Nature. And it was going to be like how to survive an avalanche and how to survive a shark attack, how to survive a crocodile attack. But, but it was like half animals, half just other things that I've actually a lot of had a lot of experience with just because of the things that I've done. And then when I started to write it, I was like, I don't really want to write on anything but animals. So let's just make it animals. And so we had to kind of adjust the title and the, the nature of the book. Um, but it, the only reason they, they accepted it is, I guess, survival type stuff is really hot. You know, they wouldn't just, I, I pitched a bunch of things like cool animal or cool world biomes <laughs> from the biologist <laughs> in me. And they're like, that sounds terrible. No, we're not going to do that. I was like, really? You could do desert animals and then you could do rainforest animals. And they're like, yeah, that's no, no one is going to buy that. <laughs> yeah. Biomes is not sexy. Biomes. Yeah. Oh, biomes. That'll be the Although type. <laughs> middle schoolers might be all over that though. Cause biomes I know is a big area of study. I actually, one of them I call grade. <laughs> well, and my, my son who's in fourth grade is in the Minecraft and they have biomes. So I was going to call it Minecraft biomes in real life. Oh, that makes sense. You don't play Minecraft, obviously. Uh -uh. I'm, I don't play video games. My husband gets mad at me for that. Because <laughs> he plays video games and you don't. Yeah, he's like, why don't you play video games? And and he acts like I've never tried it. I'm like, I grew up with video games. I used to play like Mario Brothers. I'm like, I don't want to play anymore. I don't, I don't like it. See, this is an interesting thing. <laughs> I'm trying to get my son into wildlife stuff. And all he wants to do is video games. Yeah. So part of me is thinking, if I want to teach this, somehow I have to get a video game that he wants to play. But I don't know. Times are constantly changing. And that's the weird thing about e all of what we do. As I soon know. as you figure out one thing, it changes and it evolves into the next thing. And so it's a constant cat and mouse, I feel like. I know. Somebody just texted me and said they got invited to that new app. I can't remember what it's called. Um, the one where people are talking to each other. Uh Oh no. No, not TikTok. It's it's um it's it's invitation only. What is it? I can't remember anyways, but it's kind oh. of like Twitter, but you just chat to each other. I'm looking to see if I can scroll up. Clubhouse Clubhouse, that's what it's called. Oh boy. Um and it's exclusive oh, and I'm just like don't invite me. Like I <laughs> I just added TikTok and I what kind do you of regret it sometimes. What do you think about TikTok? So um in terms of like fun, I actually, in terms of like watching, mm -hmm. I actually really like it and find it highly, highly addictive. It um, is very addictive. Yes. Oh my gosh. Now, like, I feel is, like. What is TikTok <laughs> tapped into in your brain? That's what I want to know. <laughs> like, you, like, what are you seeing in your feed? Oh, um, it's not even like really interesting or good stuff. It's just like, I don't know the way they have it set up. It flows so easily. And it's just, it's like playing slots at Las Vegas or something. I never play that, <laughs> but you're just like, I got to do one more. I got to do one more in case you find a good one. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so new to it. So I'm trying to think about, well, I liked a couple of dog things. And now I get a lot of dog videos, mm. um, like talking dog, you know, like people talking for their dogs and stuff like right. that. Um, I mean, a lot of like the trends that are going on. So like, okay. like, like there's like, like the, the before where the person's like really normal and non-sexy and then after where they're like doing the booty drop, I'm getting a lot of those <laughs> or, or with, um, Megan, these stallions, like I'm doing hot girl shit. <laughs> like you, I don't know, You've probably seen those too. And it's like a joke on that. Well, I got off TikTok about eight months ago because uh, okay. I, yeah, those are pretty it's new addictive. Then. It's addictive. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I, I don't think it was healthy and not, not just because it was addictive, but the videos it was feeding me gave me a skewed view of the world. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, making videos for TikTok, I think is very difficult. Like it's like, in some ways it's really easy, but then to make really good videos, you have to like time it all out. And it takes so much time to like 
change the text duration and everything. It's just, it's very time consuming, but I really joined because Instagram reels, they took away my reels. I don't have any reels first. They took away my music and now I don't have any reels and I don't know why. So that's why I joined TikTok so I could add to add, add things. Instagram. Yeah. Oh, to add back. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. I had people tell me because I create short Instagram stories, they're like, you just should just put it right on TikTok. And so I, of course, was like, well, can you make money doing that? <laughs> because I got to make money, first of all. And they said, well, I think doing private live stuff, you can. Anyway, I don't know. I tried it out for a little bit and it just seemed way more work than I was getting back out of it. Yeah. Too. But one of my friends, she went from like nothing to like 225 followers, thousand followers pretty fast. So that's why, yeah. So I was like, huh, there's still not a lot of scientists on here. And I don't really think wildlife Ooh, people, that? she does something totally different, not in science. Oh. Um, and she like, <laughs> part of the reason is probably because she talks about like, like, like female sensuality and stuff like that. So, I'm just, so there might be, <laughs> so there might yeah. be some of that. Well, I wonder. that people people oh. are more ex- excited about that than they are about learning the difference between a red fox and a gray fox. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah, I, f- I also find it's really hard to get anything across that's too educational in yeah in fifteen seconds. So I was like, oh, I'm just gonna have to stick to what I do a little bit um, i can't evolve well, to something like tiktok <laughs> and i <laughs> always think the the best i always think your website is is first that you should re- rely on search engine i mean this is just for anyone not for right. for i mean for you obviously v- youtube is number one but i think for anyone out there doing science communication getting a website is the best because then you can get that organic search from google because everyone's on on the internet not yeah. everyone's on facebook or instagram and then YouTube, because YouTube is a search engine too. And when you search on, on the internet, a lot of times videos pop up as a result. So those two, I think, are like the, the main things that scientists should care about for communication. The great thing with YouTube is that it has a long shelf life. Yes. Yeah. Whereas when you create a TikTok, mm-hmm. like it's good for the first few days. And same with an Instagram story that disappears. Right. You know, so at least on YouTube, you can create, you can spend time on something you know is going to last a little while. So you yeah. talked about, you mentioned the potential of YouTube and that you wanted to go back to that. What, what did you mean by that? Well, in the same way that I said, well, it, taking what I said about the science channel stuff, how I, could, I had a career for a little while, and then all of a sudden someone decided I wasn't a real scientist. I was just a TV host. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And then I didn't have a job anymore. If you can gain enough traction on a platform like YouTube, which it's likely not going to go bankrupt, then you have the platform that people can come back to. So you have the audience and then you can reach out to people to try to get funds to create the videos. Does that make sense? So yeah, I look at people who are quite successful on YouTube and they're really good and and I don't want to diminish the work that they're doing, but I think I'm like close to the level, even though I'm not quite there yet. Um, They have a huge potential to keep going. They have a job. There's some security there, Um, Mm -hmm. but you do have to gain a lot of followers. Um, One of the things I didn't do well over the years, I think was retain fans, so to speak. So like you probably, do you have a, you have an email list, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's some ways that you can stay in touch with people so that if you put out something new, you can reach out to them and say, go check it out. Mm -hmm. Um, Early on, I, because we weren't on YouTube, we were putting it on Blip TV and on Rever, which was another video site. All Mm -hmm. of our fans disappeared. I didn't have an email list. So for the first like eight years, almost by eight years had already come up there were a lot of people that loved our stuff you know it's we had we had the one of the top 10 podcasts on itunes for educational stuff but there's no way to retain your fans on itunes you know what i mean right they're just there or they're not and um so i think youtube's nice in that it allows you to kind of keep in touch with your subscribers but that also can could change overnight you never know but I, but I like the potential of YouTube better than some of the other platforms. 
Who do you think is doing a really great job on YouTube? Um, I think the person who I would like to at least feel like I'm doing similar stuff to is Derek Mueller with Veritasium. You know, we talked right at the beginning of his uh, YouTube channel uh, back when I was doing stuff with Pearson. And um, I like his style. Um, I like the way he tells science stories, incorporates his is filmmaking into personal stories about the topic and he does stuff in the field it's not all green screen stuff you mm -hmm. know so just like pumping out stuff for the sake of pumping it out I, li I like his work yeah so for scientists who are not doing this full-time but they still mm -hmm. want to make videos do, does their equipment have to be fancy or do their videos have to be fancy or can they be just very rough around the edges <laughs> Yeah, well, like, we talked like about mine. Mine are rough. <laughs> no, yeah, we talked about this before. Um, I think, I think, probably my advice now is, um, you have to figure out who is doing something similar to what you're doing, and just make sure you're doing a little better than them. Does that make sense? So, mm -hmm. if you're in a very niche field, like I have um, a friend, Yuri, who is a bark beetle entomologist mm -hmm. and he puts out the best content for bark beetles <laughs> <laughs> like he he's got an iphone and a, like a gimbal for his iphone and it is the best bark beetle content but you know not a huge field it's not that difficult to <laughs> become the best bark beetle person but you know for me i have i'm setting my goals on youtube and being sustainable on youtube so that means i have to up my game a little bit more um but I think for a lot of people, you, you, your story can trump. So you have lots of pieces to what makes a good video. Your story, um, your presentation skills, uh, quality of audio, quality of video. I feel like, I feel like the quality of, of the technical things can be a little bit lower if, if one of the other things is higher. But at some point, they're all, it's all a balancing act. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they can be super simple. And one thing I like to tell scientists that are getting into it is if you just know a few basic skills and you're trying to do it, you're trying to communicate in this platform, it will, it will make you make your communication that much better. Okay. So like, as an example, we can all relate to this. If you're on a zoom call with somebody who is terribly lit, like terribly lit and they have terrible mm -hmm. audio, it like, it makes a difference. Like it's kind mm -hmm. of terrible to listen to that person. And all they'd have to do is know a basic understanding of how to light themselves and they'd be fine. And then it would be all about the content. So you just want to eliminate the distraction factor and allow your, your actual content to shine through. And you have YouTube videos on this, right? I, yeah, we have a YouTube channel called science filmmaking tips where we talk about some of the basics of doing all that. Yeah. Go you watch make that. Plug you it. should make. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> you should make it as a course too. That could be a way to generate income as well. Yeah, you know, for a while I thought maybe we could make science filmmaking tips our real our gig, and it was yeah. all, all of our income would really come through that. But um, that you know, at some point I decided I didn't want to be making tutorials all day about how yeah. to use different programs, and I was like, oh, I want to actually tell stories of animals, so I just need to shift, even though that was starting to really take off for us. It was nice, but it wasn't taking off quite sustainably yet. We, I was doing it with my friend Jonas, and we were pulling in about 900 to 1,000 a month together, doing it full-time. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> But you could do it as like a, a course that you sell to people. Yeah, I've seen people... I've seen people do that fairly successfully. Could, yeah. 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 So we're almost out of time. Oh, really? I wanted to, Look at that. Yeah. I wanted to ask you one more question then I can, and then you can leave us with some final words of wisdom if you want. Um, so if you could make a video about like any animal, what would it be? Like no, no, like budget's not an issue. Security is not an issue. Like, like security in the country or safety mm -hmm. is not an issue. What would you choose? I would probably do a film underwater with narwhals in the Arctic. Oh, yeah, that'd be really fun. That's pretty hard to get to. That'd be fun. Yeah. I've always wanted to do narwhals, and that area is hard to get to. That would be pretty fun. And we talked about them on What on Earth, too. 
That's right. <laughs> or at least I you did. Know, it's so funny. <laughs> you and I go back and forth on everything. Or, you know, they only have so many slots for biologists. So it's like you and I, you or I would get one or the other. So it's like, oh, we'll give that one to Stephanie and <laughs> Rob or Rob, one of those two. <laughs> and Roland too. And Roland. Yeah, I know there's, they got too many biologists. They, I think they, do you get the ones that are not biology related? Do you get like <laughs> Nazi concentration camps? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I always tell them like, okay, I have no idea how to talk about Nazis, but we'll go for it. Let's do it. A lot of, actually the last time I had to talk about like Jeffrey Epstein's like Island. Oh, really? <laughs> I did too. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know how to co- they're like what's your reaction I'm like ew gross <laughs> like this is disgusting and they're going to use but, that <laughs> <laughs> it's like I don't know what else to say but um anyways I always love doing what on earth I think it's fun um <laughs> well thank you so much did you have any anything else you wanted to say before we end our interview I feel like you and I could chat a long time on all this yeah so. You know, I don't know. I think I think if anybody's watching out there and they're thinking, I would love to do science filmmaking or wildlife filmmaking, then I would encourage them to um, reach out and actually chat to somebody who does it as a career. Mm-hmm. You know, you can call call me up, uh, call call anybody else you find up on Instagram. Everybody's happy to chat because I think it's useful to get a realistic picture of what it takes because there is an illusion that it's all fun and games all the time. Yeah. But that's part of the illusion that we're putting out there. It's not necessarily how it works, but we do need more people telling good stories. So I think most people would be excited to help people get started and show them so that they don't get depressed when they get into it (laughs) and then realize it's different. I think following up on that, I think a lot of people don't realize you have to be a good entrepreneur and business person too Mm, like you have to like sell sell yourself and pitch yourself and and as scientists we're definitely not trained to do that at all no if you don't like bragging about yourself to some degree (laughs) because it's what the nature of the job you have to sell it uh then maybe pick a different career (laughs) yeah okay well thank you so much and i hope you have a great day you too Thank you. That was such a great conversation. And I want to highlight two points. At the end, Rob talked about reaching out to him. And this is something I tell my students a lot. So many of us are nice and we're willing to share the information that we have. So don't be afraid to just cold email people. And in the case of Rob mentioned I, that you listen to his podcast interview on this YouTube channel or this podcast. And, um, yeah, that you really want to talk to him just for like 15 minutes of his time to get some more information about this career because you need to do your research before you go into these careers. Like Rob was talking about some of the salary things and how it looks really sexy and fun from the outside, but what is it really like in the day to day when you are in the editing room? I can tell you from doing What on Earth, the TV show, it looks really glamorous to film things, but so often we have to block out the light and we're in these dark rooms filming. So it's it's very different than what you see on TV. So just just reach out to people and see if you can have 15 minutes of their time to talk to them. The other thing I wanted to mention is maybe you can make up your own career and that's what Rob is doing and um, that's what I'm doing too. So I've been following my intuition lately and actually for a long time I've kind of said I don't know if the career that I want exists for me and I think I've been right and That's what I'm doing right now is I'm making up my own career. So don't be scared to be unconventional and look to different sources for help. I turn to a lot of entrepreneurial podcasts for help. Um, So so yeah, just try branching out and being creative and making your own path. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you guys have a fantastic day.